So uh, thank you for joining. Quite a packed house. I wasn't expecting that. So let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, as, I was, as was said, uh, my name is Robert Zahadinczyk. I'm currently working at Red Hat as a senior technical support engineer for Ansible products. But before I switched uh, sides, I was uh, for about five years a DevOps engineer working on implementation of DevOps practices in various companies and was one of the people responsible for architecting how those practices will be implemented, which tools will be used, and how the overall workflows will be used. And during that time, I heavily relied uh, on Ansible to provide me necessary tooling, mainly for automation, but as I would like to show in this talk, uh, uh, it can be used for much more. So let's take a look what I would like to talk about today, next 15 minutes. So first of all, uh, since this is an entry level beginner talk, I would like to describe what is a DevOps workflow, what I think about it. Uh, what I mean uh, when I say uh, we want to scale a DevOps workflow, uh, where can we actually put Ansible, where can we fit it inside this workflow, what it can do for us, and some whys uh, about why to consider it, why, why to use especially Ansible. So let's begin with uh, some basics uh, about what is a DevOps workflow based on. So, uh, it's, of course, based on DevOps principles and DevOps concepts, which uh, are, for me, based on four pillars. First one is culture. So in DevOps uh, culture, we want to bring people and processes together. Uh, we also have a pillar of automation, which creates for us the natural fabric for all the DevOps practices that we are going to do. And uh, then we need measurements because uh, in DevOps, we have this uh, notion of continue, continuous improvement, and measurements allow us to see if our changes uh, make sense and if we are moving in the right direction, and we, then we need to adjust. And lastly, uh, it's about sharing, because we would like to enable collaboration and feedback from other people that were not initially involved in designing DevOps workflows. So in case we are going to scale, beyond sing single project or single team, we want to hear back if what we designed initially made sense for broader audience. So what is DevOps workflow about? Well, essentially it's about efficiently producing useful outcomes. Uh, because we want to somehow deliver changes from development and production, uh, we want to continuously improve this method or this workflow of producing or introducing and delivering changes uh, from one cycle to the next. Uh, we also uh, think uh, in those workflows about how we can enable new opportunities for not only providing value, but also for providing, exper for providing experimentation. Uh, it's definitely not just about velocity. DevOps workflow is not just about how many deploys you can do per day. Uh, it's essentially, or it can be essentially thought of as a framework in how we are going to implement DevOps concepts in your organization. And there is, of course, no, no uh, one size fits all. So DevOps workflows can be implemented in various ways by various tools, and it's also very dependent on how your organization is structured and what best fits for your use case. Uh, so. So this is usually how uh, people depict the workflows. In, uh, it's an infinite cycle that goes from planning and implementing software changes or code changes through building, releasing, deploying, operating in production, and then going back through monitoring and int introducing patches or, or enhancements. So what drives the workflows for us? So first and foremost, it's the need and uh, the, the want to eliminate repetitive tasks and time singles. Uh, this is something that is going to change over time as you uh, progress with your DevOps activities uh, because you will be reducing friction and enabling more frequent iterations. So suddenly the, what is repetitive task will not be, for example, just introducing the same change to 100 servers, but will continuously, for example, change to how can you enhance your continuous deployment to 
much uh, broader set of uh, projects, not just a single project that you started with. Uh, so, third thing, third things, uh, thing that uh, drives the work workflows is uh, automation. We want to apply automation wherever it's possible. So usually when we think about DevOps, it's also coupled with the notion and with the idea that everything can be written as a code. So the automation usually comes in form of uh, continuous uh, integration and deployment pipelines, infrastructure as a code, for example. So let's take a look on some very, very simple work, DevOps workflow, how it could look like. So as a first step, we have, uh, we were writing some uh, new code based on our uh, version control flow. So for example, you are implementing a Git flow or you are implementing something much more simpler. You introduce the change version in your visual control, then your CI tool kicks in, detects the changes, pulls, the, uh, pulls them, tries, starts the build pipeline. Uh, that also triggers uh, any required testing environments to be provisioned and the builds to be deployed on them so we can start testing. You do all your testing that you need and report back the results. Uh, once this happened, you maybe have some uh, approval process. So for example, you are using pull requests, so somebody has to approve your code changes and then merge them. Or maybe you are so far ahead that you have automated mergers, so your code's, uh, code will be merged to some uh, production branch, for example. This again kicks in the, the CI, the, the, which again starts a pipeline, but this time it will be pipeline, for example, to production. And after we are in production, uh, then we have to continuously monitor and manage uh, the desired state of the, of the deployed software. So when you look at this uh, example workflow, something that is very nice about it is that most of this is uh, CI driven or Git driven, and which allows us to heavily rely on automation, uh, which tells us that the majority of the scaling we want to do in the workflow will be based on uh, the automation toolbox that we will choose. So how we can scale our continuous integration and deployment software and pipelines, how we can uh, scale our infrastructure as a code tools as well. One thing that we need when we want to scale, we need our tools to keep up with the increased demand. So when our infrastructure grows or our organization needs grows, then we, do, we make, need to make sure that the tools can keep up with them. Uh, and uh, then we also, in, when we try to scale this workflow, we want to enable collaboration and reusability of something that we already created, so mainly the automation fabric. And lastly, we would like to enable soft service to others, so the tools that we pick can then provide uh, access to the automation and to the overall infrastructure as a soft service to others, so we don't have to uh, be, bo uh, be bothered by uh, creating, for example, tickets and having somebody manually creating for us or hitting some button to deploy our software. So once uh, we know what is a DevOps, a DevOps workflow, so let's take a look on what Ansible Tower and Ansible Engine I can uh, give us. So uh, basically, uh, you can think about Ansible Engine as a universal automation language, which can scale through different uh, parts of your organization, not only the IT. It provides you a human readable format, so you write your uh, automation in uh, YAML, uh, YAML files, and it comes with uh, nice built-in features that, that will allow you to create uh, this collaboration and reusability, uh, collaboration and reusability. <coughs> uh, they, will allow, they will allow it will allow you to collaborate and reuse reuse the automation, uh, but that's. Not all you probably will need, so Ansible Tower comes in handy when you want to glue together uh, different parts of the, of the workflow that you will create. 
because it gives you a transparent way how to execute the automation defined in Ansible. Uh, it also provides us a solution how to scale, which is the, that's something that we want, to scale our tools with increasing demands, and it also allows us to create the self-service. So some building blocks of Ansible. Uh, the first thing that you uh, will see when you, when, you, when you start working with Ansible is that there is a great set of modules which are the basic units of code that are executed that will be making the changes on the desired targets. Those modules are used in something called tasks, which are the smallest unit of work. Uh, examples can be starting and stopping a service or removing something from a load balancer. Uh, we can bundle tasks in uh, something called roles, which are shareable collections of, uh, of tasks. And the, the, when I say shareable, then we have, uh, because we have uh, tools called Ansible Galaxy, and Molecule that allows us to share the roles with others, and Molecule is, is a testing framework that allows us to create a testable roles so we can trust our automation. Uh, examples of roles can be installation and configuration to the whole web server, uh, deploying an application. So you will basically uh, uh, create all the steps and define all the steps uh, that uh, are required to deploy your application, and you can put them in a row. Playbooks are uh, the high-level uh, description of, of desired outcomes. So playbooks can be uh, seen as an ordered collection of tasks, which means that you can put all the tasks in the playbook as well, or you can use all the roles that you created and put them in a playbook. Uh, playbook also uh, requires to give you, uh, to, requires that you give it uh, an inventory, which is the collection of hosts that you want to run your automation against. And in inventory is the list of targets. So some examples that can be seen. This is an example of task. Uh, this 19 lines of code does one thing, and that it deploys EC2 instance uh, in a desired region with uh, some instance type image and we can also define how many of them we want to deploy. Uh, as you can see, uh, the module is this little part here. It's called EC2, which is something that comes with Ansible. You don't have to write it. You just uh, it provides you an interface, and you can fill in all the necessary uh, variables or parameters, and that's all, basically. The Things on the right side uh, is uh, our definition of variables. So I'm not putting in aesthetic values, but I'm allowing uh, these values to be later overridden. This is how an uh, actual role looks like. So this is the role that is that has the task from previous slide. Uh, it all the tasks necessary for deployment on and provisioning of the EC2 instance are in one directory. I have two tasks list here uh, just because uh, I would like to do some pre-flight checks, which are, again, some tasks that will just execute different modules to let me know if I already deployed the same instance with the same parameters so I don't do the job twice. Uh, you can also uh, define some default variables which will be inputted in the, in the task if you don't provide them later. This is the definition of molecule, which is the testing framework that I mentioned before. You can, uh, uh, this way, you can define uh, a test of, that will verify that the basic behavior of your role is working and you don't have any bugs. Some example how it can look like without going into much detail is, you define a test sequence, which is the t uh, set of steps that uh, Molecule comes with, and it will check some basic, basic lit errors, syntax errors, it will execute your playbook, and you can run all that stuff in Docker containers. So moving forward, this is uh, 
an example of playbook, which is using the same role uh, as we saw before uh, by including it in this little part here. We also, as I said, have to provide a list of hosts that allows us to target uh, or deploy the, the tasks to different targets. In this particular instance, I'm running it against localhost just because the EC2 module is not actually running against AWS instance, it's running against AWS API, and so I, ha I need to run it on localhost because that's where I have the libraries and all the dependencies to ask or communicate with AWS API. A bunch of other things that I'm doing here is that uh, in the role itself, uh, I define it in such a way that uh, it will take only static variables. So for example, when I would like to simultaneously create it 10 different instances with 10 different configurations, I would have to run the role 10, 10 times in the playbook. So to make it more efficient, I just override the variables in the playbook and, and I use a looping mechanism that allows me to define in some more complex structure what instances I want to run and then pass, loop over them and pass the expected values in every run. So this is an example how a playbook can look like. Okay. And uh, since I said that the roles can be shared and that we can use something called Ansible Galaxy for it, this is a prescription for uh, using Ansible Galaxy, which uh, is uh, a simple mechanism how you can define from where your roles should come. By default, Ansible is looking to a very specific directory in, in, the, in the path. It's called the roles directory. And if something is not defined there and you're trying to use it uh, in your playbook, it will complain and will not run. But we can define external sources, like for, ex for example here, uh, that uh, the role that I'm actually would calling AWS-EC2 should come from a different Git repository. This way, we can uh, define and, and create our automation in such a way that we can create this small building blocks that will be living in different repositories outside of our playbooks, outside of the repository with our playbooks, and then anybody can reuse them later. So we would like, since we are talking about workflow, and workflow is, as I said, highly tied to CI system, as, as I showed in the first example, uh, this is a, these are, these are two examples how we can execute our automation. In the first picture uh, on the top, uh, we are directly running Ansible playbook command, which is uh, something uh, you can think of naturally, but one of the problems with executing uh, or binding uh, the CI with the automation in this way is that it's wholly dependent on how uh, much power you have in the CI. So in when we want to scale and when we want to run more tasks and we want to automate much more of our workflow, suddenly if your CI cannot scale with it, you are in the position that your automation cannot keep up with your demand. On the other hand, the second picture on the bottom doesn't directly run the playbooks, but rather queries an Ansible tower, uh, which is done through Tower API and therefore the execution is not done on the CI system itself, but rather on completely different transparent system that provides us execution of Ansible playbooks as a service. And to take a look how Tower is providing us that, to, we have to understand some basic blocks uh, in Tower. So before we can run any uh, job or any Ansible playbook, we have to define all the parameters that you would have to define in the Ansible playbook command if you run it from CLI uh, yourselves or in the playbook uh, YAML file itself. So we have to provide credentials uh, that will uh, trigger, for example, uh, they can be uh, SSH keys, they can be uh, AWS uh, 
credentials and so on. We also have to provide uh, some way the inventories to Tower. We have to tell it from where it has to ta uh, should take the roles and the playbooks, which is done through uh, object called projects. And uh, then we can start defining our job template. Uh, last uh, resource that object that I would like to mention here is that uh, this is jobs, and jobs is just the execution of the job template. So it's a running instance. On the left side, we can see that not only we can define all these parameters of, of Ansible uh, in Tower, we can actually segment them so not everybody has to see all the credentials, all the inventories, all the projects. Uh, that is done through a role-based access control system that uh, Tower comes with, and it allows you to create organizations, teams, and assign users to these organizations and teams, and then assign the objects to a particular organization with the correct permissions. So, for example, when you have people that only want to, or only need to execute the playbooks but don't need to make any changes to them, you can define it in Tower in such a way so your automation allows or the tower allows you to only run the automation. So this is how you can you will bundle the job template with all the parameters. So you you will tell it which playbook to run, which from which uh, project, which inventory, and what credentials it should be taking. On top of these basic blocks, uh, Ansible Tower provides us additional. Uh, Features. One of them is that uh, workflow that you can put all the project updates, inventory updates, tasks, and the job templates itself into something called a workflow. And that way you can build uh, different pipelines. So when we would look at the e example from the previous few slides where we were defining how to run uh, our deployment through uh, CI, then what actually was run of when we when we trigger it through Tower is it was run this workflow, and what it did is it it updated our project where we define all the automation. It ran a job template that provision our EC2 instance. Then it updated uh, all the inventory from AWS, so we have the new instance in uh, in our inventory. It can continue in the deployment. Uh, then we deploy the application, and, and if anything happened uh, that was unexpected, we could always roll back. Uh, you can also, uh, through Tower, enable something called prompt on launch, which is just a functionality that allows you to ask the user for the input when he's trying to run the, the job template. This way you can provide arbitrary extra data variables or change the default defaults that you define there. You can also uh, trigger the job templates in completely different way. So uh, we, we have a notion of callbacks there, and when we look back, <coughs> what callbacks allows us to do is that in this step when we were provisioning EC2 instance, we had to do additional two steps. We had to update the inventory, and then we had to deploy the application. Uh, but with callbacks, we can shorten this cycle by just provisioning the EC2 instance with something called a callback script that will have a specific URL of the job template which is deploying our application. And when the instance is booted up and, and running, this URL is called and we don't have to write the whole, uh, the next, two ta next three tasks uh, in the workflow, but rather the instance itself will trigger this process through the Tower API. So let's go back. Uh, next uh, good thing that Tower provides us on top of uh, pure uh, Ansible is that when we would uh, run the playbooks uh, or the whole automation through a CI system or uh, or command line, we usually lose a lot of information. So Tower provides a lot of output, on, uh, provides a lot of output on what it's doing. And uh, when you want to enable uh, or expand your automation and scale your pipeline, then you would like to know what happened, who triggered it, 
and what was the result. And there are many tools for that, so you can use, uh, you probably are, you can use Splunk for um, log mo monitoring of logs and other metrics. You can use uh, Elasticsearch, uh, logs search Kibana stack. And Tower, uh, Tower allows you to send all these extra data about the runs to these services as well, so you can manage all your monitoring and logging through uh, specific tools and you don't have to have your logs through different parts of your workflow and your toolbox. Uh, next, uh, Tower solves our scaling requirements in two ways. It uh, has a notion of clustering, so you can create a cluster of Tower nodes which are not for high availability, but they are for spreading the load, so for giving you much more execution power that you would have on a single instance. Uh, second approach is isolated nodes, which is a special type of node which is not connected to a cluster, but it allows you to execute uh, the playbooks the same way as uh, you would do from normal clustered instance, but uh, this instance needs only be able to answer on SSH, since Tower will transparently allow you to run an, any playbook and any automation on uh, this isolated node by uploading all the necessary parts of it and then collecting all the output. So we are still having the same functionality as if we run it uh, in a clustered instance. This is handy in cases where you have uh, a secured uh, part of your network or a DMZ where you don't want to put additional services but you still want to use the same uh, automation. Uh, and finally, uh, what Tower allows you to do with these uh, clusters and, and isolated nodes is it allows you to put them in something called instance groups that uh, give you the ability to dedicate resources. So you probably will need some resources to, to run all the testing environments, all the provisioning to production, and you not, don't necessarily need to have all the resources assigned to, for everything. So with instance groups, you can segment which tasks run on which instances, and that way you can better utilize your infrastructure. And again, it's all provided transparently through Tower. So we are not tying into any additional tool in your workflow, but it's all done on a single location. And last thing is something that we added in the latest uh, release is something called job slicing, uh, which is a mechanism that we introduce for scaling single job execution. So when you run a playbook, either from a command line or even from Tower before the latest version, all, it was only run from single host, which has the limitation that how much uh, things you can do and how much in parallel you can do the things it was defined by something called forks, and the forks are just parallel processes. So when you, for example, wanted to run uh, your automation again, thousand servers, and you in, you set your forks count to 80, so you needed 80 processors to be on that single server to parallelly run all the 80 proce processes and all the 80 uh, parallel connections to, to the servers. And it was going then sequentially by by every 80 servers to, to uh, until it finishes. But with slicing, you can, you can do something uh, cooler, and that's defining uh, how many different groups of your inventory will be created. So for example, when we had 1,000 servers and we set slicing to 10, then if we would actually run the same playbook 10 times on 10 different servers, but all, every time only at, uh, against 100 servers. And this way, we can scale and create uh, much uh, better execution times. So put it all together, and this is uh, how Ansible automation looks like. Uh, so on top, we have our playbooks uh, that are provided uh, to Tower. Uh, we have Ansible Tower that provides us the role-based access control, provides us uh, the visibility in what's going on when we execute the jobs. Uh, provides us uh, the user interface either through the web UI or the Tower API, so it's a normal REST API, and then in, it runs transparently everything that Ansible Engine provides you. So everything that you can do with Ansible Engine, you can transparently then do in Ansible Tower as well. Uh, 
So now let's uh, take a look how we can actually plug all this functionality and all these uh, features into our DevOps pipeline. So first thing that I would like to take a look on is uh, the stages of building and testing. So Ansible isn't a build tool, isn't a text testing tool. While you can still execute arbitrary commands through it, it's not meant to replace your CI. But what you usually need to do in these uh, stages of the DevOps workflow is you need to build infrastructure for testing. So when we go beyond unit testing, that can be run on the CI itself, and then you probably in the integration phase or the acceptance test, you need to have some additional infrastructure deployed. And for this, you can utilize Ansible uh, as a part of the of this stage by using the same automation for creating the test and uh, test environments as you would use for creating a production environments, and essentially bringing all the environments to the to be identical. Uh, next, uh, we have releases. Again, uh, this is something that Ansible isn't particularly built for, so it doesn't have any specific modules that allows you to interact with various uh, repositories or uh, allows you to upload uh, something to various repositories like Artifactory or Nexus, if you know what they are. But uh, you usually do this through the CI too. So you install some plugin to Jenkins that allows you to upload uh, things uh, to your location or you write a best script for it. I argue that you can do the same thing with uh, Ansible by just utilizing the generic shell or URI modules. If you are using Docker images, then you are uh, on the better side because there is a native way how to manage Docker images through Ansible. But with the URI or shell module, we can also manage a release process to arbitrary tools. And this is the example how it could be done. So what this set of tasks is doing, it's, up, uh, it's uh, uploading and promoting a build uh, artifact from our uh, CI tool. So on the first task, uh, I've written this whole automation against a tool called Artifactory, which is a universal uh, repository management system. So you can have under one umbrella or your RPMs, uh, jar files, Docker images, and anything else. So uh, this tool allows you to have a promote promotion process, which is a process how you can uh, have multiple repositories for the same artifact, and you can promote the artifact between different repositories depending on uh, which stage of your DevOps workflow you are. So for example, when you build uh, the uh, pull request and it's uh, just built from the first development changes, it will go to development repository. And then when the first test pass, it will go to additional QA or staging repository. And if all the tests pass, then you can promote it to production. And to do that, you can write a groovy script. So what this automation is doing is ensuring that our promotion plugin is present, then making sure that it's loaded and we can, we can use it. And during the, the pipeline, when our tests pass, we can promote by just querying the API our artifact to different to next stage or the next repository. And this is something that, as you can see, I, again, parameterized, so it's not uh, static. So if you want to uh, add uh, different, or you can, you can run it, you want to run it against different repositories or different builds, you can still do it. The only thing that you need to provide is the correct variables. So this automation always works as expected. Uh, the last two things that uh, we can connect Ansible to in our DevOps workflow are deploy and operate. These are the two parts that uh, Ansible was actually built for and allows you to use uh, almost all modules for doing these two things. So uh, initially or usually people start with uh, dying to deploy through the CI tool its, uh, itself. So they write some uh, simple scripts inside the CI tool and that will deploy the artifacts to their desired location. Uh, but by using Ansible, we can again detach this process from the CI tool and 
putting it back in our automation language so it will be unified and not in independent on which CIT we are going to use eventually. Uh, some interesting modules that you can look for uh, for deployment are uh, so modules that can manipulate monitoring because usually when we are deploying things, we uh, want to make sure that we are not triggering any alarms uh, that are making sure that our servers or our systems are running fine. Or when you have a clustered environment, you probably need to interact with load balancers. Then we have, we have these provisioning modules, which is probably everything in the cloud section of the documentation. So as I used uh, the EC2 module, or we can use Azure modules, uh, Google, uh, Google Compute Engine modules, or OpenStack. Uh, if we are deploying our uh, software through some system services, then we can interact with them as well. And the deployment itself can be done, as I showed before with the get URL or we can use uh, simple copying of files. The last thing is uh, something that uh, is very nice to have uh, when you are doing running updates. You want to make sure that uh, the deployment actually succeeded and if you are adding a new server to the cluster that you are adding something that is working. So some examples uh, how we can again take uh, uh, something, for, uh, something built in Artifactory so we can simply just call a URL and deploy the desired artifact to the desired location from, from the system that we are using. And as I mentioned, uh, we can also verify that after we deployed uh, our software and it's, for example, web service, that it is, it is responding to uh, our request and it's, it's working as expected. Oh, this is a basic execution of every URI module, which just takes a URL. Uh, I'm defining here, here something called a health endpoint, which is the usual way how to define a health check for, for your web service. And I'm expecting that it will be returning an HTTP 200 code. And then in the content of the returned, uh, return from this call, I'm just looking if uh, there is a word running. You can look for any arbitrary text string here just depends on how you define your health check and what is returning. If it's returning JSON, you can even process JSON here. Uh, so uh, some more complex example is uh, to put it all together, we can define the whole rolling update scenario in our Ansible automation. So there are two new things here. We have something called post, post tasks and pre-tasks, which are the concept in Ansible that uh, execute uh, some additional task before we execute roles or, or some regular tasks or, and something that happens after all the execution from the roles and, and regular tasks happen. So what I do here is in the, before we st even start deploying anything, I just remove uh, the server that I'm going to deploy to from load balancer. Uh, I'm then waiting that uh, there are no uh, existing connections uh, to this server. Afterwards, I run uh, my deployment uh, automation, which I defined as a role, so it's replicable. Afterwards, when it's done, I again if go and add the server back uh, to the load balancer and do, I'm doing it after I check that the server is starting to respond. So the last part uh, is operation, which uh, operate, uh, operate uh, phase, and which is basically day two operations after you deploy a software. So if you know what those day two operations are, it's basically everything that you do after you successfully deployed your software to production. It's, it's continuous monitoring, it's, it's uh, managing uh, logs, it's continuously patching the systems, uh, having a disaster recovery scenarios implemented. Uh, so, one example can be, for example, here that after I deployed uh, my uh, Greylock service, then I want to update uh, how I'm managing all my indexes there, which is the place where, where all the data are stored. And what this does is just deploy, deploys a new cron jobs that will move my data between different uh, tiers of storages and archive what I don't need anymore. Uh, the s second example here is uh, something from a disaster recovery uh, 
a point of view is that, for example, in production, when I have a Postgres crustler, one of the master nodes can fail, and I need suddenly promote a, a slave instead of doing it in manual way or uh, executing some script, I can define it as a playbook, which will do the tasks all, this, uh, all, all the time the same way. So what it does, it just uh, makes sure that configuration file is in the correct location. Uh, it turns off uh, a configuration option in, in one file, uh, promotes the slave, and then restarts the service. So I'm running the uh, running now the database from the slave and not the master. So to summarize this talk, uh, one of the things uh, that you should take away from it, I hope so, is that the DevOps workflow is just a framework for implementing DevOps practices. It's not what DevOps is all about. Uh, that Ansible Engine and Plus Tower gives you uh, a scalable, transparent in automation that you can use throughout the whole workflow. You should think of utilizing Engine to provide a common language, how you define your automation. Uh, use Tower when you want to delegate usage because it allows you to transparently execute playbooks in the same way through either API or the user interface. And you should utilize Tower when you want to scale your automation because it has the concept of clustering or isolated nodes and allows you to just treat your automation as a service to the rest of the tools in your workflow. And since uh, DevOps workflow will to the most part, it always heavily dependent on uh, on your automation because most of the steps are dependent on it. Uh, therefore, the overall scaling of the workflow will be always based on the automation tools that you choose and how they can scale themselves. So that's all from me. Thank you. <laughs>